which aims to improve the status of biodiversity by safeguarding ecosystems, species, and genetic diversity. Um, we have with us uh, Dr. Trevor Sandwick, who's going to discuss Target 11, which aims that by 2020, at least 17% of terrestrial and inland water and 10% of coastal and marine areas, especially areas of particular importance for biodiversity and ecosystem services, are conserved through effectively and equitably managed, ecologically representative and well-connected systems of protected areas, and other effective area-based conservation measures, and integrated into wider landscapes and seascapes. So it's quite a mouthful, um, but basically it's about um, in-situ conservation, it's about um, more effective uh, protected area management, so not just in Africa, the Middle East, and Central Asia. More recently, in the US and Latin America. He started working as a wildlife ecologist in and around Cosmin Natal in South Africa. And then he went to work as head of planning in the Natal Parks Board, focusing on the role of protected area systems in sustaining economic and social development. So that links very nicely with the discussion we just had about livelihoods and, uh, and social aspects. Um, so from 2001, he coordinated the World Bank UNDPG as sponsored Cape Action for People and the Environment um, as part of the South African National Biodiversity Institute. He's also served as the chairman of the Flower Valley Conservation Trust and as a council member for the Robben Island um, Museum World Heritage Site. He has also been the director of Biodiversity and Protected Areas for the Nature Conservancy. And his focus is on finding common ground in biodiversity and climate change policy, articulating this in international policy venues, and facilitating national commitments and public funding. He's passionate about social justice and a wide range of interests in history, art, and music. And he's a keen hiker. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder where this all came from. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have, um, have special agents, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's a keen hiker and mountaineer, and um, he's actually well on his way to having climbed all the peaks in Africa. Yeah. The highest peaks. Okay, well, <laughs> over to you. Today is to talk about Target 11 and what I've put on the screen as a kind of a hope for a protected planet. Um, because that target is extremely complex and I will try and, and, and open up. The issue is that the world has agreed uh, in Nagoya to protect at least 70% of the land and inland waters and at least 10% of coastal and marine environments in systems of protected areas that do all sorts of things and we just have to remind ourselves what that is so conserving in those areas that are particularly important for biodiversity and ecosystem services that are ecologically representative and well connected, that are effectively and equitably managed, including other effective area-based conservation measures and integrated into the wider landscape and seascape. So this could be the whole strategic plan for biodiversity if you really want to get down to it. Um, protected areas can never, uh, and I, I, I'd like to make this point, be regarded as some kind of uh, set aside that is just part of, uh, you know, that is not connected with the other goals. It's absolutely imperative that we see protected area systems as a fundamental part of the, uh, of the approach towards the strategic plan. So I'd like to open up a number of these areas in turn without going into it exhaustively because you're probably tired and it won't work. So the, the real, the first thing is this issue about protected areas conserving nature and that's how IUCN would like to look at it. Biodiversity somehow doesn't quite capture in the way it's being used the idea that these are socio-cultural concepts that biodiversity resources are, are, are and cultural resources are integrated in the way people and nature interact. So we have set targets, we're somewhere here, and we need to get somewhere here. And you can see that you know, our rate of change isn't quite matching our ambition. But actually, uh, we also need to know how we're doing on that. And how are we doing? 
First of all, the world is doing quite well, setting aside protected areas and investing financially in them, quite well in relation to some of the other attributes that we'll talk about in this se session. So this is the, the global biodiversity outlook that was presented in Nagoya, you know, a bit of a shame that um, we certainly had not met the previous target. But protected areas are also doing very really well. A recent study looking at uh, thousands of, of uh, species in hundreds of protected areas shows that protected areas on the whole are managing to do their job, which is you know, really encouraging news because there's always that doubt, you know, will it work? And we don't know except when we wait and see. The other thing is that we haven't really yet started to figure out how well they are connected. There's no global standard for connectivity. But a recent analysis that is being done at the level of the data that we do have shows that in some cases, protected areas are very well connected. And I, for example, point to, say, Latin America, uh, the, 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 the Amazon, um, and where there is great connectivity, um, even surprisingly in Europe, um, where one thinks of very fragmented landscapes, actually there's a range of ki different kinds of protected areas governed in different ways that are actually quite well connected by the land use planning systems in that part of the world. So here's something to watch. Um, uh, zooming in, uh, this is a part of uh, northern Canada where actually that concept of connectivity is being encoded into the land use planning system. So the biodiversity considerations, the sexual development considerations all have to be brought together to show how connectivity takes place. And that means linking up different kinds of protected areas, those that are governed by the state, those that are governed by the private sector, and in this case, by First Nations. So let's just look at the next particular topic, is this idea of effective management. You can't do this job unless you have skilled institutions and a lot of skilled people and the kinds of skills that they need are becoming incredibly complex. How do you, how do you address issues of climate change? How do you address issues of social equity? If you go into any one of the you know, 200,000 protected areas that are around the world, will you find people who can do all of these things at the level of competence that's required? And will we find capable agencies that have figured out how to work with the Ministry of Economy, how to work with agriculture, how to work with fisheries, forestry, water affairs, disaster risk reduction, insurance companies, banks, communities, you know. We're really putting a lot of pressure on a, on a cadre of people to be able to do all these, these things, but it's critical. Um, IUCN and the World Commission on Protected Areas has invested a lot over many years in trying to develop the right kind of guidance. Um, whether it's to, for example, uh, assign the appropriate categories to protected areas, or whether it's to um, understand what are the financial costs and, and, how, and, and how to sustainably finance protected areas, these are all critical questions. And um, just at this COP, for example, new guidance was, was, uh, was released on ecological restoration, and we've heard calls now for that to be uh, something that is taken up much more broadly than just in involving protected areas. But the point here is protected areas are also a really good place to learn how to do things and then how to apply them in the wider landscape. Um, and not just the landscape, but the seascape. So um, there's new guidance on how to apply marine, uh, how to apply categories to marine protected areas. Probably the most important thing that we need to think about is that we really only learn by doing. We only learn by actually going out and trying something, seeing whether it works, and understanding it. The other way we learn is by going and looking at what does work, shining a spotlight on that. If we find a community has managed to figure out how to make the trade-off uh, between how much you can use a fishery and, and how much has to be conserved, that's a really stellar example of what we can apply in other places. So we don't always have to address issues as a problem, we can actually also go out and look for places where it is working and magnify that. Um, I just wanted to mention that you know, there's still a lot of investment going into capacity development. A uh, project that we're involved in, involving four regions and several agencies, is about developing capacity at institutional level uh, for exactly this. 
Moving on to a different topic, this issue of equitably managed. Protected areas, it's, it's a slight, it's a strange wording in the target. It really comes from the concept of, of, of equity, equity in governance and the equity in the cost and benefits that are, that are created by systems of protected areas. So it's a shorthand, but protected areas have to respect people. There's a, there's, a, there's a check in history, if you like, about protected areas in the world. And this target gives us the opportunity to go back and address some of those things. One issue is, how is governance facilitated? How is equitable governance facilitated? And one has to go back into the constitutions and the laws of countries to see whether people are enabled to play their appropriate role in protected areas. It's not just a top-down issue, it's an issue of rights, of responsibilities, of duties, and how that is actually inculcated. So here we have a really important opportunity to start looking at equity at that level. We also have to look at equity at the level of practice. If you go to a site, if you, if you go and look in, in a landscape, what will you find? You will find protected areas that are set aside and governed by governments or local governments. You'll find areas that are actually de facto managed by indigenous peoples and local communities. In other cases, by the private sector and corporates and trusts and NGOs. In the other case, you find combinations of these things where um, an area might be the responsibility of government but is actually being governed and managed by a, lo a local community. But we don't really understand all of that yet. And we don't have databases of these things. So in another room in this, in this venue today, the ICCA uh, colloquium is going on, the Indigenous and Community Conserved Areas and Territories. And they're looking at what contribution uh, they can make to this particular question. The other thing I mentioned was the issue of social assessment. What are the costs and the benefits? And who do they accrue to? Who pays the price of protected areas? And who benefits from their existence? Very big open question that this target raises. Another thing that, that, that comes up very strongly is what counts? Um, the target includes the term other, if, other uh, effectively conserved areas. Other, yeah, sorry, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm not uh, being that lucid. Um, and the question is some of those areas like indigenous and community conserved areas that have the purpose of conserving biodiversity would obviously come towards the target. But there's a whole category of areas where that maybe they don't. Maybe they're uh, areas where biodiversity is degrading and isn't being effectively conserved, and they shouldn't count. But we all have to figure out now how to get to grips with what's in and what's out, and which of those actually are protected areas, which are other if other areas which conserve biodiversity effectively and which are those areas that are actually just they might conserve biodiversity in part but they're not really something that should count towards this target i think this is one of the key questions not only for this cop but for this particular discussion but we're certainly seeing certain kinds of areas like locally managed marine areas growing in number communities figuring out what kind of management and governance protocol needs to be put in place to actually achieve conservation and the sustainable use of biodiversity and the equitable distribution of costs and benefits. And uh, so I just draw your attention to, to that. So how about this issue of integrated into the wider landscape and seascape? You know, it's, some, it's somewhat curious that you know, sometimes you get, a, you, you get people talking about protected areas and saying, yes, you know, the first responsibilities, we need them to conserve biodiversity. Then you say, why? You know, why, why would a government be motivated to invest in that? Why would communities do it? They do it because these places have a value, spiritual and cultural values, and economic values that are more, that are more tangible, like water or food security. Uh, or the protection against a tsunami or, you know, or the effects of a flood. But it's not wrong to think about how protected areas actually work for, for humans and offer solutions. So these are, not, these are not just intractable problems that the world has to solve. If we didn't have carbon stored in the forests that are in protected areas, um, we would have a much greater crisis to deal with in the climate issue than we currently do. If we didn't have 
well-managed mangrove ecosystems uh, blocking uh, you know, a storm surge, what would we do about that? So slowly the world is waking up to this idea that actually protected areas have values that we didn't think about when we set them up, but in some serendipitous way they're actually providing that. Um, and we have to figure out how to guide managers as well as administrators within the protected area community and beyond the protected area community, how to integrate that. So whether it's in climate change or in water supplies or in desertification or disaster risk reduction or health or food security, this is a new challenge for us that this target opens up. And we've got to think of the tools that it will take to do that. Integrative land use and marine spatial planning tools are in their infancy. So let's find some good examples and see whether we can attach that to our work on this target. So now towards the end of the, the talk, the question really then is, what does that target add up to? You know, if you break it down into all these little component parts, we could be measuring this for decades to come and still not get a big picture. What we're saying with target 11 is that you've got to do it all. Target 11 is about getting it all right at once maybe progressively, but in the end, we want to show that it can all be done. And so we're starting to think about a new global standard, at least for protected areas, that we're thinking about giving a very positive uh, message of a, a green list as those areas in the world which manage to get it right. Um, those areas that actually kind of set the gold standard or the green gold standard for getting it right, when all of the terms of Target 11 are met simultaneously and maybe we've got it right. And so I just want to um, mention that one of the things that led to the strategic plan and Target 11 was the work, the program of work on protected areas. That work was done at the World Parks Congress in Durban in 2003. We have a World Parks Congress coming up in Australia in 2014. Maybe that's the time for the first time when we look at Target 11 in its whole set of complexity and try and report to the world midterm through the strategic plan what is really going on so uh, with that uh, thank you for the opportunity